Welcome to Sponsored Post, behind the lens of how influential content is made. I am Justin Moore. I'm the founder and CEO of Trending Family, which is an influencer marketing agency that launches campaigns with family-friendly influencers. Today, I'm so excited to be joined by Tatiana Nestra, who is an author, blogger, and food influencer. She has over 850,000 followers across YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest, and she makes absolutely mouthwatering dishes, especially desserts. She's the author of the European Cake Cookbook and the forthcoming Beyond Borscht. Welcome, Tatiana. Thank you so much for having me, Justin. Thank you. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the podcast. And so I thought I'd just kick it off and and start by asking a little bit about your background, how you got into cooking, your story, your family, you know, what did you do before YouTube, you know, that whole thing. Yeah. Well, you know, I have loved cooking since as long as I can remember, I think about eight or nine years old, I really started baking. I loved making cakes and cookies. And I mean, that was just my world. I mean, I didn't even like eating them as much as I just enjoyed being in the kitchen. And my mom just really supported me from the get go. She was just always encouraging me to cook and bake. So I started off as a really, really young age. And I love to create my own recipes. I'd have like a stack of old cookbooks. And then I just, as I grew older, I just continued with that. I, when I moved out, I started doing a lot more like savory foods. So my parents and my family are, are from Eastern Europe, from Ukraine and Poland and Russia. And so my mom really instilled me this love for this traditional recipes. And so that's really been, you know, part of my kitchen even today. And how did you start first? Because obviously you have a YouTube channel and you've got a blog. And so which came first, actually? So what came first, actually, was I wanted to do a cookbook of all those incredible recipes. So this was like probably nine years ago. So I wanted to do a Ukrainian cookbook. And I literally wrote out a book. I had I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, I just want to do this. And so I started reaching out to like agents and publishers. And they're like, well, you don't have an audience to sell to. I mean, this is a really cool idea and everything. And so I actually started with just Facebook. I started sharing pictures of my food on Facebook. And then one day my husband was like, you know what? I have all this camera equipment and I've seen Laura Vitale on YouTube. He's like, you could be like the Ukrainian version of Laura Vitale. And so that's how it started off. My husband actually pushed me. He's like, you should do this because your food is really good. And People are going to you know, like watching you. So that's how it started. Interesting. Do you remember your first episode, like pushing publish on that and you know, the feedback that you started getting when you first launched all this content? What was that moment like? Oh, my goodness. It was, it was overwhelming because I mean, I've, I've done a lot of like Photoshop work my whole life. I actually studied photography for like three years in school. I actually have a photography background. And... I still had to learn so many new programs and I finally put it together and I, it took us two like the first time we filmed it, I didn't like it. We scrapped it together. I think I made cabbage filled piroshki, which are like little hand pies. And I think that I had to make it twice. The first time I was like, this is no good. So we filmed it again another weekend. Mind you, I'm like working full time trying to do this. And then I finally got it up and I was really excited about it. I was like, I think people are going to like it. And I actually got really great feedback from the get go. People just really enjoyed. I mean, there was lots of room for improvement on like, you know, filming and the audio and the music, but people actually really liked the concept. People really liked the recipes. And how did people find you initially? I think it was just through because I had I already started Facebook. And a lot of our just like our, our friends just knew about the fact that I was starting this like little YouTube channel. So my family and friends really like stepped in for me when I just started. I mean, it was just like 20 people, but 20 people knew 20 more people on Facebook. And it really started from social media. People would just be sharing. And then as it's being shared on Facebook, people are subscribing on YouTube. And it really kicked off like that. Just word of mouth. <laughs> mm hmm. And so as, you know, things started growing and you mentioned, you know, you had a full-time job, you know, so when was the moment when you kind of realized like, wow, this could be a thing, you know, this could be a full-time endeavor? You know, I wish I'd realized that earlier on because when I, when I first started, I didn't see it as a job. I just saw it as a hobby. I saw it as like, okay, I could do this. Like, this would be fun. Then a couple of year, years down the road, people are like, hey, are you monetizing? Are you making money off your blog? And I was like, oh, you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I really wish somebody had told me this earlier. And so it, it was like a couple years down. And then I was like, oh, I can actually make money off of this. And it was like two or three years later down the road. I was making a couple pennies from YouTube in the beginning. But 
to like really see it like as a job. I'm like, oh, okay. And I mean, I was, I was working full time at a dental office. I was doing like 38 hours there. And then every day I'd come home from work and I was doing like two videos a week at that time. And so I was like editing. I was filming on the weekends. I was editing in the evenings. And then I was like, you know what? At one point I was like, I really, really love this. So I'm going to switch to this. <laughs> mm-hmm. And my husband was just so supportive. My husband was like, you know what? Let's do this. I mean, if other people could do it, you could do it. No, absolutely. Because there is kind of an opportunity cost, right? Like all the hours that you're spending at your other job, think about what you could do if you focus all those hours on, you know, your burgeoning business. Exactly. That was me at the office. I would sit there at the desk and I was like, I could be doing so much work right now at home. I have like all these video files to be edited and all this to do. And at some point I was like, you know what? I I really love this. And you just, when you're like really passionate about something, it's going to work. When did a a brand first approach you and and what did you think when that happened? So I got approached, I think the first time, I think the first brand was American Express, I believe. I think that was my really first project. And I was just blown away. I was like, oh my goodness, a big brand like this wants to work with me. And that was just, I think that was one of the points. And I was like, wow, like I can actually do this. Like, this is so fun. And I'd only dreamed of doing that kind of stuff. I'm I loved cooking for myself, but it was like part of what I do is I love to share my cooking. I love to almost like give classes, but I don't have anywhere to give classes. So when American Express like noticed me and I was like, wow, like that is so cool. I never even thought that would happen to me. So, (laughs) Mm -hmm. And tell me about what that campaign was like, because I mean, American Express is not necessarily the most obvious choice to work with like a food influencer, right? Yeah, exactly. So tell me a little bit about that campaign, because I think that that's fascinating. So this is probably the most interesting campaign because I've never actually had another one like this, but they were doing like a little series about using this card in like everyday life. And so they filmed me, they actually had a film crew come out. We w- went to a local like seafood distributors for the, like all the local sushi restaurants and they filmed me picking up some fish. And so part of the ad was, you know, I had the American express card in my hand and paying for the fish, you know, we're going back home. They're filming me in my home preparing this amazing meal. And so it was kind of like, I use this card for business. I also use it for every day. And then like, just kind of tied it all together with this incredible recipe. It was really fun. It was, especially for somebody that had never worked with the brand to be able to have that experience was incredible because I've never had that again. And that's super interesting because I think we're seeing that a lot where brands are turning to influencers instead of traditional actors or actresses to be in that type of content, right? And I think there is a little bit of a difference, right? Because, you know, as an influencer, you've already got a built-in audience, right? So you've got that authenticity. And yet at the same time, the brand is able to turn around and use those videos, you use that content on their channels or in, you know, for paid media, for doing other, you know, kind of larger campaigns with those things. So is that a direction that you see, you know, moving in terms of your content? Are you open to those types of partnerships in the future? Absolutely. And I feel like I feel the more natural, the better, because the way I buy things a lot, a lot of times, like nowadays, I don't watch the commercials on TV, you know, you skip over them, or you're watching things on Netflix. And so a lot of the products that I'm buying today are like really using or sharing with my family. It's like things that are very natural to me, things that I see that are presented in a natural way. And for me, like that campaign with American Express is all about just being at home, like being myself, going out to the store, you know, I'm getting my fish, I'm coming home. And it's like, it was a really natural thing to do. And that's what I I really liked about that campaign. It was just, it was like incorporating something that you never would even think that would work like American Express with a cooking channel. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty cool. Absolutely. And, you know, you you have quite a bit of traditional media experience, right? I mean, you've gone on a lot of uh, local TV shows around your area. Tell me about that experience. How did that first start? And, and how has that kind of helped the authenticity and kind of your professionalism on camera? Oh, it's, you know, it's been, I, I don't know, I'm just so honored that I got the chance to do this. But before any local TV show, I actually got to go on the Today Show. Wow. <laughs> I, went, I went to set many times on the Today Show. And it was really cool because they found me on YouTube. They actually found me on YouTube. I never would. I mean, I was like a small, tiny little channel. And I just had some Ukrainian, like Russian recipes. I had borscht and piroshki. And they saw me. 
they really liked my demeanor on my videos and they're like, Hey, we would love to have you come out. And it was such a great experience because you see a whole like different side to like media and film and screen because at home here, you know, when I'm filming at home, I get to stop and, you know, re-record myself. And it, you know, it could take me a couple hours to film a video recipe and there, like you're in the studio, they mic you up and your segment's done in five minutes and then it's just over and it's done. It was really cool though. It's really influenced me. I like, I just, I, it really gave me confidence. I think just you could do this and it was so much fun. I loved it. It was, it was really great. <laughs> You know, I think that that's kind of a different experience, right? It's like one thing to be able to stop and start and, you know, redo something. But when it's live TV, uh, you know, or a short segment like that, it's a little bit different. And not everyone has that comfort level. So I think that's truly amazing. And, And so when you decide to work with a brand, let's say a brand approaches you, what are the things that you look for when they approach you? You know, is it do you want kind of the campaign to be fully baked? Do you want that to be very explicit about your talking points and essentially what you'll be covering? Or do you prefer it to be, you know, a little bit less baked, I guess? Absolutely. I think I think the more open ended it is, the more I can make it natural. And that's what I, I love when a brand comes to me and they're like, you know, we love your recipes. We'd love to see you incorporate it in your own natural way. And that for me is just so much better. Like when I have a brand that says you have to say X, Y, and Z in this and this order at this time in the video, it really stresses you out because you like, you want it to sound natural, but at the same time, it's like you have to get in these talking points and being given like more creative freedom over how to present it really makes, it's just, just completely different. I love when a brand says, you know what? We love your stuff. Just make it natural. And that's when it happens. That's when the magic happens. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's kind of a tough conversation sometime, right? Because you, you know, you have entered into this kind of business partnership with the brand and, and you, you've committed to doing certain things. How do you have that tough conversation with the brand and kind of push back a little bit and say like, look, like you need to trust me on this. This is not going to turn out well if you make me do this. Like how, how do you gracefully discuss that? I think just presenting it almost like I've done this in the past and this has worked for me. So I think just bringing up examples of like my viewers really didn't like this. They, you know, that they, they could tell that it was really like an advertisement and they didn't like that it was an advertisement and people will like leave comments. They're like, you know, this sounds like an ad campaign and I can bring up those examples. I'm like, you know, this in the past hasn't worked for me. I want it to be natural. And I think that's the best way. And then when you have one of those natural advertisement kind of videos, people love them and people will keep watching them because it doesn't seem like an ad. It just seems like another video recipe. So how much do your viewers dictate both the brands that you decide to work with and your just general content strategy? You know, quite a bit. From the get-go, I started with like savory recipes. And then I, I also started doing sweet recipes. And people will comment, you know, like, we love this. We want more of this. And so I actually like try to do like more of these recipes. And people will make suggestions. And sometimes I don't. I've never cooked that food before. So maybe I'll try it at home and I see if I like it or if I don't like it. If people don't like something, I'm probably not going to make it again. Or maybe I'm not going to make something even similar to that again. So I really look at my past performance, you know. People, for example, they really like fish tacos. So I'd be open to making like something similar to that, but people didn't like some kind of like spread or something. So I'm probably not going to do a spread video sometime in the future, like soon, because it just didn't do really well. Right. And so a lot of people have noticed this trend over the last several years, whereas, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, the tasty style kind of hands in pans, overhead shot videos were exploding on social media, especially on Facebook, right? And I think that we've seen a noticeable shift towards a little bit more kind of personality driven content where people are engaging with you, right? Like, are you also seeing that shift? And, and how, how do you think about that in terms of the videos you choose to make? You know, I've always shown my actual face in the videos. I've never just done like kind of like hands video. So I've always been doing like an interactive kind of video. I'll talk to my viewers, you know, have like a little introduction. And so for me, I've always liked those kind of videos. I never really liked just the hands, although that was popular. And so, you know, for social media, we would do like the cut downs. We would do like a one minute, you know, little clip. And it was just your hands because you just didn't have enough time. And I feel like now that we have, on Instagram, you have the Instagram TV and on Facebook, you can upload these longer videos. 
now that we can upload longer videos, we can actually put ourselves into it. And that's what I love. And I love doing that. I think people absolutely love seeing your face. They love like seeing you talk to them and it makes it so much more personal. I love that. And I mean, I've always done that and now I'm doing it even more. Absolutely. And so, you know, we talked about a really great campaign, American Express. It sounded like it was, it was, you know, super engaging and unique. Tell me about a campaign that didn't go so well. You don't need to necessarily name drop. <laughs> Are there any kind of like lessons learned that you can think about from other campaigns that haven't gone so well? So there is one campaign that just went horribly wrong. It was a canned food company. And I just don't really use canned foods to begin with, but I was doing this campaign. It wasn't with Trending Family. It was with a different a different company. It wasn't with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had a bad campaign with you guys. I think that off the bat, it was just like they they didn't want to honor my prize. They were trying to you know get like a cheaper cheaper video. And just off the bat, it was just like, we don't want to honor you like as a creator, almost like that's what they were trying to tell me. You know, they were like, well, we don't want to pay you that much. And maybe you could do it for less. And then they gave me an outline of what they wanted. And then I filmed everything. And then they came back and said, well, we actually want this and this. And it was like, and then I had to refilm and I had to refilm three times. And then, and then they wanted me to include this stuff and this stuff. And it was just so unnatural. It was just so odd. I hated everything. I hated the recipes that I had to make. It was like they dictated everything that I had to do. And it just felt so unnatural. People hated the videos. They didn't take off. It was just horrible from the get-go. And I feel like I learned that I need to not compromise. You don't want to compromise on anything. Don't compromise on the brands that you work with. Just work with the brands that you love, that you know that you'll be able to incorporate naturally. Yeah, just stay on your ground. And I felt like I was just really run over with that campaign. And I was like, I don't think I'm ever working with these guys again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think it's, you know, we have heard that story a lot where, especially in the beginning, it's sometimes difficult, I think, to value your work, right? Because I think a lot of people, especially digital creators, think they only have to value themselves by how many followers they have. When in reality, so many brands will prefer to work with, let's say, someone who has 50,000 followers versus 500,000 because that smaller creator just fits the brand so much better. They, you know, they're the mission, the values, the overall aesthetic. As a creator, you really do need to value, like, you know, you, you need to be paid what you think you're worth, especially in this era where brands are using the content elsewhere, right? It's not just going live on your page. You're there may be doing some paid media with it on Facebook and Instagram or something like that too, right? So there's a lot of value there. Yeah, there's a lot of value in it. And I yeah, I feel like I feel like creators should know that like if you're making great content, it's worth something. It's it's not free and you shouldn't be working for free. Yeah, just don't compromise. I feel like I feel like the moment you compromise, you're letting yourself down, you're letting your creativity down. And it's like when somebody's telling you like you need to do like really, really specific, and they're not valuing your, your product, you just you don't even have a desire, you don't even have like the, how do you say it, like the enthusiasm, and you're gonna people are gonna see that in the video, people are gonna see that in your content. So it's just not good for anybody. And you are on so many different platforms. I mean, like you mentioned, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you've got a very well read blog. So how do you like think about content strategy on each of those different each of those different platforms, especially like when a brand approaches you, do you say like, hey, I'd like to make a cut down for this, you know, for Instagram, and I want to do a blog post with it. And, and do they defer to you to use your expertise and say, like, you know, these are the platforms I think will it'll perform best on? Or do you find people are mandating like, no, we want you to activate on Instagram? Or like, how are you seeing that as the time goes on? I feel like they always expect something. But I, I feel like it's usually just the platforms that do really well. So for me, I know like some people have Twitter. I've never really kind of kicked off on Twitter. And so for me, I'll like my top platforms will be like Facebook and Instagram. So I'll let my like, I'll let the brands know like what I have. And like, even before I sign any contracts or before I get any projects, I kind of present to them, this is what I have so that they know in the future, like they're not expecting of me to do something that I don't have, you know, I don't have like an audience on Twitter. So they can't really expect me to post to Twitter. I, I do try to when I when I do recipes, I try to kind of share them equally across the board, slightly different versions. So for example, with Facebook, 
it's usually just like a short, like little blurb and then like a video versus on Instagram, people will read a little bit more on your post. So I try to do like a slightly longer post on Instagram and then YouTube is just YouTube. You need, you know, your whole description box. And then my most like in-depth would be like on my blog post. So each platform is like a little bit different. And I guess you just learn as you go, like what's best for you, you know, and, and just go from there. Fascinating. And, and, you know, one thing I'm always kind of curious about is what are kind of the main cost drivers for a digital content creator? Because there's all these kind of different levers that I think creators consider when they're trying to set a rate to work with a brand. So there's things like exclusivity, right? Are you going to disallow me from working with other brands in this same space for a certain time period? There's usage rights, right? Are you going to be like reposting this on your channels and putting paid media behind it? You know, are you, how many posts are you requiring me to do? You know, how extensive are the talking points? Like, are those kind of the main categories that you consider? Or are there other things that are important to you to decide how, how much to charge? Yeah, absolutely. All of those, all of those things are so important. Also, just, I feel like uh, the depth uh, of like the recipe, like how involved is this going to be? Because for me, it's all about the time. So for me, my time is so valuable because my day is like not long enough. I could always use a couple extra hours. And for me, it's like, it's about the time. It's the involvement. So like, if I'm going to be spending just weeks and weeks on this, and if I know that ahead of time, I can set my rate appropriately. You know, if it's going to be a long-term project versus you just want like this quick little video that I can get out in like a couple of days and it's going to be up and live and like, you know, we're ready to go. There's just so many things that go in there. And also you have to consider your yourself as a value. You're also, you know, like, what's my value? Like, how many people is this reaching? Like, what kind of audience is going to be seeing this? So th- these are all things that are going to be benefiting the brand. So you also have to give yourself a value as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and do you find that brands are requesting that they kind of have like a phone call with you prior to you starting production, like to go over the, you know, creative brief or talk about, you know, what they're looking to accomplish with the partnership? And do you find those types of things valuable? You know, honestly, I don't get too many phone calls, but I wish I had that because usually it's just like an email and, you know, we'll just pick a recipe. But I think it'd be really helpful if a brand were to like, okay, this is what we're looking for. And like, maybe I have some ideas to just toss back and forth because sometimes I'll, I'll like think up of like five different recipes and they're like, oh, well, we don't want seafood or something. No. (laughs) And so I'm like, Oh, well, if I had known, I didn't, you guys didn't want seafood. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have spent all week thinking up of all these recipes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Communication is definitely is, is key. You know, I think as you mentioned earlier, even you don't really watch TV commercials anymore, right? And especially like millennials and, and Gen Z, they're kind of these mobile first media consumers. And so I think what some brands struggle with is kind of this the ROI, the return on investment of working with an influencer, right? Because, you know, especially in your space, the food space, how many people did that video that you made actually drive people in to purchase the product in the store? I think that's the elusive kind of metric that a lot of brands are, are vying for. And it's sometimes difficult. And so how do you, if you had to sit down with a brand and kind of convince them, what is the value of working with an influencer? What would you say? Well, I, th- I think it's just people trust me. I've, you know, over the years, I've built up like credibility with people. I've, I've had people that have been watching me from the first video. They'll even comment though on my videos. They'll be like, Hey, you know, I never comment, but I've been watching you since day one. And I just wanted to let you know that I love your recipes and make them all the time again and again and again. People are coming back to these videos and they're making them and they're leaving comments and they're, you know, saying like, I really love this. And, you know, once you have that credibility, you could sell that product to people. For example, I really liked, I worked with Arela Pasta. I have been using that brand for my whole life. My, like my mom used it in her kitchen. And so for me, I was like, guys, this is perfect. I have been using your stuff for years. I use it in my videos. Like, I mean, all I have to do is just put a box up there. Cause usually I unbox everything, you know, <laughs> I usually unbox everything. And so for me, like if I were to come to a brand and say, for example, like I use sugar in every single my baking videos, you know, I'd be like, guys, I don't even have to like make it too obvious. I just leave the bag right there. And then I just measure it out of the bag. And it's not even people aren't even going to think twice about it. But when they go to the store, they're going to be like, Oh, I need sugar. That's the sugar that was sitting on Tatiana's counter. I need to go get that sugar. 
it's almost like a product placement type of thing. Yeah, it'd be it, it's like a product placement. I, I think there's just so many brands that I would like to work with, you know, like, for example, KitchenAid, I use the KitchenAid mixer, in like every single one of my baking videos, you know, and it's like free product placement for them. Mm hmm. If you had to name a couple dream brands, what would they be? Uh, definitely KitchenAid. I mean, for me, they're mixers. I've always had a KitchenAid mixer. Definitely love working with them. I have these amazing copper pans that I love. I love working with them. I'll have them for the rest of my life. I think it's Mulwell. You know, all those like little brands, the people that sell you berries, Driscoll's berries, and then there's like sugar brands and flour brands and, you know, you know, just like these basic things that like you use all the time. Are there categories of brands that you really don't see yourself using? I mean, you mentioned, you know, there's certain types of products that you don't really use. So your viewers would know that that's not really that authentic. Is there kind of like whole categories of food or, or things like that that you wouldn't really touch? You know, I don't use a lot of canned food and people know that. So definitely nothing canned. I just don't. Yeah, I don't do like prepackaged like frozen stuff. For me, everything is always like fresh and made from scratch. So if I'm using like something packaged, people will be like, whoa, what happened, mm -hmm. Tatiana? I need to know how to make that sauce. I don't want to take it out of a package. Mm -hmm. And so kind of to wrap this whole thing up, I'm curious kind of like what's next for you? I mean, we've talked about, you know, you've got this second cookbook coming out called Beyond Borscht and you're kind of deep in that process right now. Talk a little bit about actually, what is the process like to make a cookbook? I know obviously recipe testing and, you know, what is involved in that? Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely the most work intensive project you could ever possibly think. I always tell my husband, they're like, a book is like a baby. It just takes so long to put it all together. This book's slightly different from my first book, Beyond Borsh. This one's been really special to me because I actually started my food journey, my food little career by trying to write a cookbook. Like I actually wanted to create this Ukrainian cookbook from the very beginning and to be able to like redo it and redo it professionally and redo it with my knowledge now has been just amazing. So this book has like just been a dream book for me. But like with the first book, the publishers actually reached out to me. So a lot of times with people, they'll have to reach out to publisher, they'll get an agency. They actually reached out to me and it's, it's a, a couple months of just brainstorming. Like, what do we want to write about? How are we going to put it together? Like, how are we going to make it interesting? And so even before you start writing the book, you have to know what the book is going to be about and you have to know what's going into it and how you're going to sell it. So really, it's like you have to know everything about the book before you even start it. It was just so much research about like, you know, all these historic cakes of Europe and then all this recipe testing and coming up with different recipes. And so it was really involved. And so like, then the next like six months, you're just literally like baking cakes every single day and you're taking pictures. <laughs> I, I, I bake I'm sure your I'm sure your husband and family don't mind. Oh, I think I baked so many cakes. I, I, like by the time I was done with the book, I was like, I just can't stand the smell of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was incredible. It was a lot of work. And it, I mean, a cookbook really takes, I mean, all your time and your energy and your passion because you really want to make it the best of the best because this is going on a shelf. You can't just like delete it off your blog post. And then the, once you're done with that, then it's just the whole editing process and, and doing that. And it's it's a really long process. It takes over a year, but it's if it's your dream to have a cookbook, then it's worth it. If not, you're going to mm -hmm. like drop it after the first month and you're going to be like, <laughs> no way. <laughs> Well, thank you again so much, Tatiana, for joining Absolutely. us today. It's been super fascinating. And so how can people find you? Like, what are your channel URLs? Where can they find your cookbooks? Yeah, so Tatiana's Everyday Food. I have Tatiana's Everyday Food across the board. It's Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube. Of course, I have my blog. So I have all my recipe posts, all my videos up on my blog. And then my cookbook is available everywhere. So the first one is available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Powell's, there's a few other like kind of indie bookstores that also have it. And then the second book is also going to be available everywhere and they can pre-order it now. So it's coming out March, March of next year. Amazing. Congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be sending you guys a copy. Yes, please do. I can't wait to try everything Absolutely. in there. Absolutely. You've just listened to the Sponsored Post podcast with your host, Justin Moore. You can subscribe to hear more great interviews and episodes via iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more information on Trending Family, you can visit www.trendingfamily.com. See you next time.